Chinese monarchs begins with the story of a man named the Yellow Emperor, who was conceived when his mother was struck by lightning and born in 2698 BCE. It was he, the stories say, who single-handedly brought civilization to his nomadic tribe, introducing agriculture, astronomy, mathematics, musical instruments, weaving, and dyeing silk. He lived until the age of 113 when he met the Chilin, a sort of chimera between a dragon and a deer who heralds the arrival and departure of great leaders. The Yellow Emperor was the first of five emperors to rule China after the reign of the Three Divine Sovereigns, and this short dynasty of sorts would later be succeeded by the Xia, a dynasty whose historicity is still unclear, as there's nothing written about them until a long time after their end. The Xia were followed by the Shang Dynasty, for whom we have solid archaeological evidence, but very little written history. The Shang, it's said, fell much like the Xia, when a corrupt king had lost the mandate of heaven and was overthrown by his subjects. What followed was the Zhou Dynasty, the longest-lasting dynasty in Chinese history, which stood for 790 years. But that comes with an asterisk, as the Zhou Dynasty came in two distinct periods. In the earlier parts of the Zhou Dynasty, called the Western Zhou, the Zhou kings held real power, but... After the capital was moved to the east, we enter the time of the Eastern Zhou, in which local rulers were far more powerful, and kings held very little authority while their subsidiary states fought each other freely. It was a time of great conflict, but counterintuitively, it was also a great time of philosophical development, as China's three primary schools of thought all arose in this time, Confucianism, Taoism, and Legalism. Ultimately, the state of Qin conquered all of its neighbors and ended the Zhou dynasty. Qin Shi Huang took a new title for himself and became the first emperor of China. He abolished the feudal system of the Zhou and endorsed legalism, and this allowed him to begin the earliest form of many great works, such as the Great Wall or the Grand Canal. But he often ruled through fear and burned many of the philosophical books that conflicted with his method of government. He chased after eternal life, but reportedly died from mercury poisoning in an attempt to find an elixir that would sustain him. Still, as a testament to his greatness, he was buried with his famous terracotta army. Unfortunately, the man who was planning to live forever had failed to prepare more than that for his death, and a succession crisis stacked on top of popular uprisings meant the death of the Qin dynasty, and the arrival of the Han dynasty. The Han Dynasty was established by Emperor Gaozu of Han, who began his life as a peasant. He had been warmed up to Confucianism thanks to a talented scholar, and phased out the much more punitive system of legalism in favor of Confucian thought, which would play an integral part in the majority of China's dynastic history as the government's central framework. Gaozu was followed by his son Emperor Hui, whose mother's shadow loomed large over his administration. She supposedly poisoned his half-brother because she saw him as a threat, and Hui was too distraught to govern. Hui would die before his mother, and so the Empress Dowager continued to rule through his adopted children. Even when she did die, power didn't immediately return to the Emperor, but rather went to Empress Lu's family, very reminiscent of the Fujiwara clan at the start of our look through the Emperors of Japan. But conspirators fought back, and eventually Emperor Wen was put in charge. Wen and his son Jing brought a golden age to China, as both were benevolent and incredibly sharp with money. Wen kept taxes at some of the lowest rates in Chinese history, and cut government spending to match, using what he had left to increase support to those without parents or spouses or seniors without children. It's said that the warehouses were so full of grain they had no choice but to leave some outside to decay. These two men were succeeded by Emperor Wu of Han, one of the most important emperors in Chinese history, and certainly among those from the Han Dynasty. He expanded his territory south into Vietnam, east to Korea, and west to the Fergana Valley, northwest of the Himalayas. China was a dominant power, and spread Han culture throughout East Asia. Unfortunately, the emperor became increasingly strict and authoritarian as he aged, beginning to resemble the dreaded Qin Shi Huang, even embarking on his own search for immortality. But his officials used that wrath to drive a wedge between Wu and his son, until the latter was forced to commit suicide. 
Emperor Wu changed his course, but it was too late. Of his remaining sons, two held no respect for the law and were thus poor choices, leaving only his youngest son, just eight years old, when Wu died. The young Emperor Zhao turned out to be wise beyond his years, but died at age 20 without children. To pick a new emperor, the court had to reach all the way back to Emperor Wu, through the son he killed, and down another two generations to find Emperor Xuan, who had grown up in a prison from his infancy. Yet he too turned out to be a surprisingly competent ruler, who understood the plight of the common people, could grapple with foreign relations, managed money well, and sought good advice. He was followed by Emperor Yuan, who tried to imitate the generous tax policies of Wen and Jing, and then by Emperor Cheng. Cheng's reign saw a rise in influence of the Wang clan, his maternal relatives, because he gave them many high offices despite the warnings of the Han Dynasty's founding emperor. Keep the name Wang in mind, as it will be back very soon. Cheng had no sons, and so passed the throne to his nephew, Emperor Ai. Ai was influenced by a number of women his own mother, the mother of Emperor Cheng, Cheng's wife, and his own grandmother. But above all, he showed favoritism to a man named Dong Xian, who at 19 years old was a mere imperial attendant, but by 22, he was commander of the entire army. There's a famous story involving Dong Xian and the emperor that says when the two took a nap together on the same mat, the emperor awoke to find his robes tucked under Dong Xian's side. Rather than wake him, the emperor cut off the sleeve from his priceless robe to allow his lover to sleep just a moment longer. But Emperor Ai died young, and despite leaving everything to Dongxian in his will, the emperor's grandmother took action first and installed Ping as emperor, while Dongxian committed suicide. But the real power behind the throne now was Wang Mang. Wang Mang was quite the character. He stripped the Empress Dowagers of their status and took away the power of their families in court, then began to model the empire after the Zhou Dynasty, even taking some inspiration as far back as the Shang Dynasty in terms of honorary titles and things of that nature. He had something of a cult of personality surrounding him and went to elaborate lengths to stage humility while amassing power. He eventually poisoned the emperor and began to look for a replacement, when lo and behold, the mayor of the capital came to the palace, saying he just happened to find a rock with Wang Mong should be emperor written on it, surely a sign from the heavens. But Wang Mong would eventually lose the mandate of heaven when the Yellow River flooded and caused widespread famine and revolt. A distant relative of the Han Dynasty emerged at the forefront of those rebellions and re-established it. But like the Eastern Zhou, the Eastern Han could not live up to its former glory days. Emperor Guangwu himself was generally a very capable ruler who didn't become jealous or paranoid like many other dynasty founders, but over time the empire's strength declined. Eunuchs began to increase their power within the court, and finally large rebellions broke out near the end of the 2nd century CE. These rebellions were crushed, but many of the generals who did the crushing kept their armies assembled as imperial authority continued to wane. Eventually, imperial power collapsed completely, and the capital of Luoyang was burned down, and power was split between three rival warlords forming three separate kingdoms. The Three Kingdoms period would end with reunification by the oft-forgotten Jin Dynasty, and perhaps the reason it's so oft-forgotten is that only about ten years after reunification, there was a huge succession crisis called the War of the Eight Princes. Then the empire was attacked by the so-called Five Barbarians, who then fractured the empire into sixteen kingdoms. The situation eventually stabilized somewhat as two kingdoms emerged, one in the north and one in the south, though the identity of these kingdoms was often in flux. But finally, in the northern Zhou kingdom, the emperor there died, and his throne was taken by his father-in-law, Emperor Wen of Sui, who went on to unite all of China. He ruled from the old western Han capital of Chang'an, and began construction on great works of his own. Though there was a previous work in a similar vein made by the Qin, Wen of Sui was the one to properly establish the Grand Canal, a marvel of engineering severely underrated in comparison to the Great Wall, a man-made river flowing over 1,100 miles that connected the most important areas of the empire. But just like Qin Shi Huang, rebellions erupted after Wen's death, and the Sui dynasty would prove to be very short-lived. 
A number of different warlords controlled their own territory, but one would rise up to capture Chang'an and establish the Tang Dynasty, reclaiming the rest of China. That man was Emperor Gaozu, helped in large part by his son, the future Taizong, who is regarded as a second founder. Taizong took power before his father died in a rather brutal fashion. He accused the crown prince of having affairs with the emperor's concubines, and when the crown prince arrived in the capital to defend himself, Taizong ambushed and murdered him, then marched into the city to force Gaozu to name him as his heir. Despite this, Taizong's reign was one of the greatest in China's history. He fought corruption, encouraging loyalty to policies over people, and further developed China's imperial exam system, an extremely selective test on Confucian values by which new government officers were selected. Taizong sent officers to survey the land and review local officials and the impact of their rule on the people. He expanded the empire's territory and brought an age of peace and wealth that had not been seen since the Han Dynasty. Another point of interest, he sent embassies to the Roman Empire, who met Constans II in Constantinople in 643. But Taizong himself had his own succession crisis to manage. Two of his sons fought for power, and Taizong banished them both, naming as heir the Empress's third son, who was kinder and gentler. But Taizong soon feared his soft personality would leave him vulnerable. He was right. Emperor Gaozong was largely guided by others, though luckily he had a number of trustworthy ministers around him. But soon, there was turmoil among his consorts. The empress became jealous of another woman the emperor was doting on, and so brought back one of Taizong's consorts that Gaozong had secretly been sleeping with, in hopes of dividing the emperor's attention between the two. But all she did was replace one romantic threat with another. This consort soon found ways to have the empress and crown prince executed, and as she grew more and more powerful, she began whispering to Gaozong behind a curtain while he was in court. And when Gaozong finally kicked the bucket, she made her remaining two sons emperor before dropping all pretense and naming herself Wu Zetian, empress of the new Zhou dynasty. She was generally speaking a capable ruler, a good judge of character who permitted little corruption, won a conflict with the Tibetan Empire, and her 40 years of de facto rule brought stability to China. But she fell from power with much irony after becoming enamored of a pair of brothers she took as lovers, who quickly became the only ones allowed to see or speak to her, controlling the empire by proxy. Wu Zetian's chancellors and generals got together to depose the brothers as well as Empress Wu, meaning her sons would each become emperor again. During Zhang Zong's second reign, power was held by his wife, Empress Wei, and her oldest child, Princess Taiping. The two nearly conspired to make Wei the Empress Regnant, with Taiping as her crown princess, and they had some real support from their advisors, but it was Zhang Zong's sister who put a stop to their machinations, and both women were killed. Wu Zetian would forever remain China's only Empress Regnant. With the arc of Wu Zetian concluded, China entered another small golden age in the reign of Emperor Xuanzang, a time period that's also notable for China's increasing contact with the West in the single battle that was fought between the Middle Kingdom and the Abbasid Caliphate. But underneath the hood of that golden age, there was a jostling for power that would shake the empire. Conflicts between a powerful chancellor and a general named An Lushan caused the latter to rebel in an incredibly bloody civil war. Census measures marked a drop in China's population from 52 million to 17 million, which would represent two-thirds of the kingdom and roughly one out of every six people on earth dying. This was probably not the case, and a large factor of this 17 million number was the emperor losing the ability to take an accurate census in the aftermath of the war, but the scar on the Tang dynasty was permanent. Suzong was emperor for most of the war, though it wasn't completely ended until the reign of Emperor Daizong, who was left with the fallout. The Tibetan Empire reconquered China's Central Asian territory, even occupying Chang'an the year after Daizong's accession. The emperor's authority to appoint provincial leaders was seriously challenged, as it got to a point where neighboring governors simply invaded other provinces to claim them as their own. His son Duzong tried to face up to these warlords as they grew more powerful with each passing year, but they had already struck up alliances with each other and defeated the emperor, leaving him weaker than before. 
Beyond this point, the dynasty entered a death spiral, with each emperor facing numerous revolts which only boosted the power of local warlords, until finally, one such warlord would come to kill the emperor Zhaozong. He used the emperor's son Ai as a puppet, but this would last less than three years before the dynasty was abolished altogether. The warlord who did this created the Liang Kingdom, but it was only one of many in the land. Seventy years of conflict followed, as each dynasty that followed Liang and all their neighbors vied to be the one to reunite China. The ultimate victor would be Emperor Taizu, who brought China back together under the Song Dynasty. This dynasty was renowned for its inventions, gunpowder, movable type printing press, an improved compass, paper money, the first dynasty with a standing navy, as well as advances in science, mathematics, and engineering. Its economic output has been estimated as three times that of all Europe at that same time. Taizu was succeeded by his brother Taizong. It's unclear why exactly, since Taizu had children, but it's suspected Taizong had something to do with his brother's death. Song, like many of its predecessors, would have a stronger period at first, followed by a weaker period, when its capital was moved from modern-day Kaifeng to a number of temporary homes and finally settled in Hangzhou in the south. This move southward was forced by a growing power in the north the Jin Dynasty, which had expanded out of Manchuria. The Jin invasion also saw a number of the imperial family captured, which is why Emperor Gaozong adopted one of Taizu's descendants, and so the rest of the Southern Song emperors would be descended from Taizu. Of course, that particular line from Xiaozong lasted only a couple generations until Emperor Ninzong, a great patron of the arts with the most commemorative monuments of any Song ruler, but ultimately a ruler whose reign was dominated by others, and when he died, it was others in the court who chose his successor, a relative who became Emperor Lizong. At this point in time, the Mongol Empire had already come into its own, as this was near the end of the reign of Genghis Khan. By 1234, the Jin Dynasty was conquered by the Mongols, though the Song would continue to hold out for a few more decades through the reigns of four more emperors. The fall of the Jin allowed the Song to recapture some of their former imperial capitals, but this came at the cost of breaking their alliance with the Mongols. The Song fought well, catching a break with the death of Mongke Khan during a siege as this led to a succession crisis in Mongolia and ultimately a redistribution of Mongol forces to other fronts. Yet, slowly but surely, Kublai Khan encroached on Song territory, seizing control of the Yangtze River, winning a decisive battle near modern-day Hong Kong, and driving the 13-year-old Song Emperor to suicide, establishing the Yuan Dynasty. It was during this time, just after the Mongol conquest, that Marco Polo made his famous journey through China, and claimed to have met Kublai Khan himself, and served him as an emissary to India and Southeast Asia. The Mongols, as they did in many places, largely kept local customs of government in place while inserting themselves at the top. Hence, Kublai Khan adopted the Chinese name Emperor Shizu and claimed to possess the Mandate of Heaven. So the government ran largely like before in most regards, though of course the size and scope of his empire meant there was a greater than usual transmission of goods and ideas and the inventions of the Song Dynasty taking place. Still, corruption and succession crises were as common as ever. You can tell that just by looking at all these emperors who reigned after 1320. Power would change hands a whopping eight times in the 12 years before the empire collapsed. Rebellions rose up among the Chinese, including the Red Turban rebels who wanted to restore the Song Dynasty, all while the Yuan Emperor was in conflict with his own generals. The Yuan were soon defeated, but it was not a revitalized Song Dynasty to emerge victorious. Rather, a peasant who had worked under one man claiming Song descent had risen in power and reunited China under the Ming Dynasty. Now I should point out here that there are many ways to refer to Chinese emperors, just like with Japanese emperors. In addition to their personal and family names, each has a temple name, which is what we've been using so far, with just a few exceptions for someone like Kublai Khan, who is obviously better known by that name. But from this point on, we're going to be switching to their era names, which is why you will hear me saying the Yongle Emperor instead of Emperor Yongle. 
The Hongwu Emperor's rule was a boon for China with significant civil and political reforms, but in what feels like a tale as old as time, it was achieved with an iron fist. He executed many of his closest allies, including generals who'd helped seat him on the dragon throne in the first place. He used secret police, purges, the lot, creating a strictly regimented society of small, self-sufficient farming communities. He was briefly succeeded by the son of the promising crown prince, Zhu Biao, but he was quickly replaced by the Yongle Emperor. Yongle means perpetual happiness, and Yongle, the era of his reign, was another golden age. He repaired and reopened the Grand Canal, acted as a patron to the legendary explorer Zheng He, moved the capital to Beijing and constructed the Forbidden City, built the porcelain tower of Nanjing, which was considered for some time to be a wonder of the world, he expanded the imperial exam system and created the grandest tomb of the Ming Dynasty. Really, his reign reads as a sort of greatest hits of all the things dynastic China is known for. And that golden age continued through his son and his grandson, the latter of which, I feel obligated to point out, was quite the talented painter. The Zhengtong Emperor, you can see, has two sets of regnal dates, as in between here he was captured by the Mongols, who were actually the surviving remnants of the Yuan Dynasty that continued to exist beyond the Great Wall. His brother acted as his substitute, but when the Zhengchong Emperor returned, his brother tried to impose his will over him, though he was ultimately removed in a coup, and the line would continue through the Zhengchong Emperor. The Hongzhi Emperor is another highlight of the dynasty, and is notable for having only one wife and no concubines, making succession incredibly easy to resolve. He had only one son who lived into adulthood. But the Zhengde Emperor was a very different man from his father. He supposedly died as a result of falling into the Grand Canal drunk, and he had no children survive into adulthood. It was around this time that China started to come into contact with European powers who were starting to explore the East as part of the Age of Discovery. There were several early battles between Portugal and the Ming Dynasty, but eventually the Ming Dynasty allowed Portugal to establish a trading base at Macau. The Jiajing Emperor, who reigned next, was succeeded by a son and then a grandson. The Wanli Emperor would become the longest reigning monarch of the Ming Dynasty, but despite some early successes, such as defending Korea from Japan in the 1590s, he oversaw a decline in the empire after he began to take his foot off the gas. Or, if we're being honest, it was more like he went on strike, outright refusing to attend meetings or see his ministers, possibly as a form of retaliation against the ministers who forced his hand in selecting his oldest son as heir, rather than the more capable son he would have preferred. Only a few decades later, the Ming Dynasty would be gone. Another threat had grown in Manchuria. The later Jin Dynasty, soon known as the Qing Dynasty, swept through China in the 1640s at the same time as the Emperor was facing major rebellions, and they created an empire larger even than the Yuan, when one considers that Kublai Khan's power over his territories outside China was largely nominal. The Qing Empire was not only the largest Chinese empire, but one of the largest empires in world history, falling only behind the British, the Mongol, and the Russian. Now, the Qing family tree begins up here with Nur Hachi, but the first to rule as emperor of China was the Shunji Emperor. He died at the age of 22, setting the stage for the long reign of his son, the Kangxi Emperor. In fact, the Kangxi Emperor reigned longer than any other emperor in Chinese history, a total of 61 years. He is generally considered to be one of the greatest Chinese emperors of all time. He enjoyed great military successes, such as fending off the Russians and taking over Taiwan and Tibet, while also laying the groundwork for a long period of stability, economic growth, and cultural achievements. He was followed by his son, and then 13 years later, his grandson, who reigned almost as long as his grandfather for a total of 60 years, and then the clean line of succession followed with his son and grandson. This period of stability allowed China to reach new heights of prosperity, but things would soon take a dramatic turn for the worse, in what's known as the Century of Humiliation. During the reigns of the Daoguang Emperor and his son, the Xianfeng Emperor, there were three incredibly important wars. I'll first mention the Opium Wars. 
The British Empire in the mid-19th century was importing quite a lot from China, and had very little to export to China, an empire that was very large and so pretty self-sufficient. The one thing it wasn't producing much of? Opium. The British began to sell massive amounts of opium to the Chinese, which of course had some pretty negative consequences. So the Daoguang Emperor made the sale of opium illegal. But Britain was counting on opium in order to quote-unquote win at trading, and so went to war with China twice, defeating them both times and imposing treaties that ceded Hong Kong and exempted British subjects in China from Chinese law. Around the same time as the Second Opium War, there was the Taiping Rebellion, led by a man who believed himself to be Jesus Christ's younger brother. But the rebellion ultimately spoke to the Chinese people's dissatisfaction with the government that had failed to protect against the British, as well as rising cases of famines and banditry. The Taiping Rebellion proved to be the bloodiest civil war in history, on par with the First World War in terms of death count, and that's without machine guns, chemical weapons, planes, tanks, or any of the other advancements of the following half-century. But the Qing lived to see another day. The next emperor of note is Guangxu, though real power lay with his mother, Empress Cixi. Guangxu, after losing a war to Japan, wanted to emulate China's neighbor to the east in their efforts to modernize, but came into conflict with the people, as well as Sushi, who feared he was moving too far too soon. The two plotted against one another, but Guangxu was sold out by Yuan Shikai, another name to hold on to in your back pocket, and the emperor was placed under house arrest while Sushi ran the empire. During Sishi's reign, people across China rose up in a violent uprising against foreign influence, laying siege to the international embassies in the capital. China was invaded by nearly every major world power at the time in response, but Sushi chose to align herself with the discontent Chinese and supported the Boxer Uprising. She was, however, defeated, and China further humiliated. Guangxu died one day before Sushi. It's suspected she might have poisoned him, fearing he would undo her legacy and push for his earlier plans if he were allowed to become a proper emperor again. He was replaced by the Xuantong Emperor, also known as Puyi. Puyi was just a boy when rebellion brought down the Qing Dynasty in 1912. Once again, there were many competing warlords, but the government that would find solid footing was Yuan Shikai's Republic of China, which would reunite the country and stand until 1949, when it was replaced by the Communist People's Republic of China, at least on the mainland. It is in fact the same Republic of China from 1912 that controls Taiwan today. But let's say neither the ROC nor the PRC were to control China, and somehow the Qing Dynasty were restored. Who would rule China today? Well, despite the fate of some earlier emperors, Puyi survived the fall of the Qing Dynasty, and in fact was very briefly brought to the throne by a warlord in 1917, but this was for less than two weeks. However, he would return to the spotlight again in 1932, when he was installed by the Japanese as the puppet ruler of Manchukuo, a position he would hold until the end of the Second World War in 1945. But there was a plan for a successor should anything happen to him. Puyi had no children, so his successor was his younger brother, Pujie. Both brothers were captured by the Soviets at the end of the war and handed over to China. But instead of being executed, both brothers were imprisoned for 10 years and re-educated. Puyi published his autobiography in the 60s and died in 1967, while Pujie lived until 1994. At that point, the head of the house became Jin Yoji, a half-brother of the two who was born after the empire had fallen and lived his life as the principal of a public primary school he established. He died in 2015, and so his son, Jin Yujang, is the current head of the house. He was born in 1942 and so spent all but his earliest childhood living in communist China, where he now works as a minor governmental official. And that's it! Over 2,000 years of Chinese emperors. <laughs>